I'm delighted to welcome uh, Bank Nordstrom, um, or Nordstrom, I should say, Matt Hatton and Tom Rebeck uh, for this panel, um, which you've entitled, Does the IoT Have a Credibility Problem? Um, so we'll just start off, um, if everyone could just introduce themselves. Um, Matt, as your closest, would you mind? Yeah, uh, so Matt Hatton, I work on the IoT team at Gartner. I'm a research VP there. I've been there for about 18 months, prior to which I was running a research and consulting firm called Makina Research, who uh, we started in 2011 and became the preeminent analyst firm in the IoT space. Tom. Yep. So, Tom Rowick, Research Director at Analysis Mason. So, I head up our enterprise and IoT research programs. We have five different research programs. Um, I first joined Analysis Mason back in 2004. Um, I had a stint at Telefonica for, for about three years before rejoining, uh, rejoining Analysis Mason back at the end of 2010. Um, ben Nordstrom, CEO of a consulting firm called North Stream. We are not, as my colleagues here, a research firm. We are more genuine consultants. So my competence and experience in IoT is coming from the IoT projects we've been working with um, in this industry for the last 20 years, uh, vendors, operators, and industry verticals. Lovely, thank you all. Um, so what I asked all the panelists to do ahead of this um, panel um, was to come up with one example. Um, so it could be a stat, a launch, a quote, something that hasn't happened yet, which for them um, really sort of typified the current state of the uh, IoT market and telcos um, within it. So um, practicing what I preach, um, I'll, I'll, I'll actually come up with one as well. Um, and, and this really sort of came from, uh, from a professor at Princeton University uh, in, in the States who uh, tweeted out um, some uh, explanations of current tech buzzwords. Um, I don't know if you're on Twitter, you might, you might well have seen this, but it got quite a lot of uh, retweets. And uh, uh, One of them, for example, was, was data science, um, and he defined that as statistics done by non-statisticians. Um, and he also did one for the IoT, and his uh, definition was Malware-ready devices, <laughs> which um, I thought was uh, quite a nice, uh, quite a nice thing. Um, Matt, do you want to start us off with, uh, with what you? Uh... Yeah, I, I, I can. Um, so we, actually, the three of us chatted a little bit before the before the session, and we uh, and actually it turned out that we'd come up with broadly similar things to talk about. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go off on an angle and talk about something something else, which some of these guys are gonna, gonna come back to in, in in a bit. But actually, my my thing is is um, actually the topic of this session. Does IoT have a credibility problem? Um, and that's kind of indicative of where we are. Um, so I, no, I don't think IoT has a credibility problem. What it probably does have is an identity problem. Okay, I'll come back to that. But the credibility issue, right? If you talk to GM, which is connecting all of their cars, and ask them whether IoT has a credibility problem. If you ask NL in Italy, which has connected all their electricity meters, you ask them whether IoT has a credibility problem, or what they're doing has a credibility problem. Or you ask Amazon about whether connecting all these echo, these, these voice-activated devices in homes has a credibility problem. The answer would be no. They're fundamental to their business model uh, in future. But the problem is that we've kind of put them all together under this umbrella called, called IoT, which doesn't uh, or hasn't evolved perhaps in the, to the scale that, that might have been predicted by some numbers, which my, my esteemed colleagues will be, will be talking about in a, in a little bit, but nevertheless is that absolutely fundamental. So the problem is more to do with just having this single overarching uh, topic called IoT, which really combines a whole host of things which have no, um, bear no resemblance to each other other than there's some form of, of connectivity in there. So that's my, that was my kind of first take on it. Lovely. Thank you. Tom, do you want to? Okay. Yeah. So I think the, the question about credibility came from the, there have been some very, very big numbers, very big forecasts for IoT. So I, I thought I'd use our forecast for IoT just to put it in some context of the, of the telecoms industry. So for 2026, Analysis Mason is forecasting that the, the mobile telecoms industry will be worth about $900 billion. So that's pretty similar to where it is today, a little bit of growth, but, but fairly similar. So $900 billion. Now, connectivity for the IoT, so where devices are using either mobile connectivity or LPWA, we think that's worth about $30 billion US dollars in, in 2026, so a bit under 3%. So relative to that core mobile business, it's still, connectivity alone is very small. We also forecast 
the, the spend, again, for devices that are using mobile LPWA connectivity, but the whole value chain, so the, the device, the device installation, the application, hosting and security, and, and, and so on. Now, for that, we come up with a number of about $200 billion. So a sizable number, but clearly smaller than the overall mobile market. And out of that $200 billion, a lot of it's not going to be addressable. When you're talking, that includes the, the figure for um, installing smart, smart meters. That's not something telcos are going to want to do. But it does include things that um, Stefano was talking about earlier, the other bits of device management, um, maybe some hardware, security, and so on, bits and pieces where uh, operators can add on to that $30 million and, and address other, other sources of revenue. Thank you very much. Ben? Um, thanks. Um, so I would start with saying I think the whole IoT journey for the telecom sector is uh, you know, really a big voyage of discovery. I think, when, I think it started with Ericsson in 2008, claiming that will be 50 billion connected devices in 2020. And um, that was a very unrealistic number. And I think now we're more protecting like one and a half, two billion in the sort of same time frame. In that way of looking at it, I think we were a lot of telecom legacy with us. We thought it was a connectivity-based industry and maybe more important, the bigger mistake, thought it would be led by the telecom sector, that IoT was an IoT, IoT was a telecom phenomenon. What we have learned in our company when we work with industry verticals and also with operators is that in industry verticals, it's not really called IoT. It's called digitalization of businesses and it goes across any industry sector, bank finance, healthcare, transportation. They are digitalizing their businesses and they are using their normal business partners to do that and they work with Accenture and IBM and Cisco and Microsoft and other sort of more IT flavored companies and when you are digitalizing a business you sooner or later need to you realize that you need to connect things and for that purpose you go to the telecom industry and ask for quotations for platform support or for connectivity support and as far as we've been able to estimate, that in itself is a, just like Tom is saying here, that's a sort of small revenue part compared to the overall revenue for an operator. So I think when we sit here today, uh, I, I, I would say that any operator that have high ambitions on IoT to make it a significant part of their business, it will be very similar to the business that Accenture is running or any kind of solution-based company where you do planning and, and, and programs for big companies on how they get digitalized when you are re a reseller of various companies' products and where you're very heavy on system integration. That is a very sizable, that's the real bulk of revenues and, and business in IoT. And I think the question that operators have to ask themselves, the one that are serious about is, you know, what, do, what kind of journey do we need to go through to be good at platforms, reselling and system integration? Thank, thank you very much. So that, that leads on nicely to what um, we really want to talk about first of all, which, which was the, uh, the value chain uh, for, the, for the IoT and, and Telco's place within it. Um, some of you might remember we, we lost this event um, just uh, about 18 months ago. Um, and strangely enough, we were having very similar discussions, which is... Very similar people. <laughs> um, which is, yes, the connectivity part of the value chain, obviously, is where, it's where telcos um, are very much active. Can they go expand beyond that? Um, ben, um, you, things you sort of picked up on that last point, have you seen any kind of real fundamental change over the last 18 months, say, with telcos moving beyond that? And you said moving into those areas that you just talked about. Well, I... I, I I think what we have observed is that it, it, we will have a, a very tiered market. You know, I mean, uh, IoT will not be for any and all operators. It, it would particularly favor the operators, I would speculate now, that are you know, number one or number two in the respective markets. Uh, preferably they are in the fixed uh, network and, and mobile and consumer and enterprise. Uh, and they 
are already in their enterprise business uh, have a, some sort of sizable system integrator business. Those are the ones that are best positions to leverage from IoT, I would say. Um, another thing that we, I think that is um, very interesting to follow now is uh, uh, there seems to be a very intense price competition on connectivity. When we, when we look at the few companies that are reporting IoT revenues, and it's Vodafone, uh, it's Telefonica, and Verizon, and I learned Telstra as well uh, when I talk to my colleagues here. Um, the, the, the growth from 2016 to 2017 was basically non-existent. So we, it, was, it was growing in connectivity in, you know, in 30, 40% or something. But in revenue, it was basically, I think, Verizon growth. The others are you know, fairly flat. And that suggests to us that when that's the case, it's probably so that the growth you have is not compensating for the erosion you have in the renegotiation of existing deals. And, and that, is a very, that is pointing to that for, for the pure connectivity part, we probably have a commoditization trend, I would dare to say. I agree with Stefan on the it's business beyond that is platforms as well. But pure connectivity is probably going to very low margin. Do, do, sorry, just on that, do you mean... Because I think they've all had revenue growth, but it's the, the revenue per connections are falling slightly. Is that what you mean? I, I actually, when I lost, if I remember correctly, when I looked at the total revenues that Vodafone and Telefonica are, are reporting, uh, that was actually not growing, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I think that's definitely, I think Vodafone's growing about 15% a year. I mean, I think on average... Our figure of the last five years has been about 20. Yeah. So when we've now looked... I mean, we've looked at it for these, for these operators. It's growing on average about 15% year on year, which is still, I mean, it's very healthy. It's not exponential growth, but it's very healthy growth. And when you compare it to the rest of the telecoms business, it's clearly good growth. But yeah, revenues per connection. Um, so I wrote a piece last week looking at the revenue per connection figures. And on average, they seem to be falling maybe between somewhere between sort of 5 and 10% year on year. Um, so it, clearly when deals are being renegotiated, there's a sort of, maybe 10, 20% discount. Yeah, so there's clearly price pressure. Yeah, we can, I mean, I, I, if, I'm, if I'm wrong on that, I like to check up the figures afterward, but it's, I would still say in a, in a, in a, if you grow in that sort of size and connectivity and only are on the sort of 10, 15 on revenue, it indicates very strong price competition. And that's what we sense in the, in the deals we actually have been working with, with our operator clients. It's, it, it's 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 a very different market. If you, I would say, if you were an operator that five years ago signed a deal with a, a big sort of industry player with um, uh, uh, with a global presence, um, and the competition you had then, and the competition you have now when you're entering into the same deal, that, it, that's a completely different ball game. Can, I mean, can, all, all the big players are there today. Can, can I haul it back to the topic of value chain? Though? That's the, just, to, just to, you know, try and get 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 back on on, on track a little bit. C couple of thoughts on value chain. Um, the first one is the value chain works both ways, right? So. Um, there's always been a question of operators moving up the stack and getting into bits that weren't their traditional roles in the value chain. But there's also a question of the big box vendors trying to impinge on the on, on the operator space, the likes of Nokia, HPE. You might throw Ericsson and Cisco into that in, into that space as being potentially co competitors in in providing connectivity as part of their broader service offering. And if you're talking about what's happened in the last 18 months, there's been a very definite shift away from that. Right, a recognition of which side your bread is buttered as a um, provider of infrastructure and services to, to, to the telco industry and not wanting to, to uh, compete to uh, compete at all with those, with, with those players. So that, that's, that's one thought. The other thought is when you, when you start talking about um, operators expanding in, in, into other spaces in, in, in the value chain, I think uh, Stefano is absolutely right that uh, in, in terms of focusing on particular verticals, and we see this across the whole of IoT. Right, what the biggest one of the biggest challenges for everybody who's a service provider in IoT is trying to do everything for everybody. Rushing around doing POCs for you know a smart lighting company over here and a, somebody who wants to connect potato sorters over here and somebody who wants to do trains and, and whatever, and there's no replicability of the knowledge learnt through running those, the, those POCs and running those projects. So it's, you know, in part it's about taking a set of, of assets and capabilities that you might have in a space, like Orange is 
done a lot of good work in healthcare over the years. So that's a natural one that, that, that they would want to get into. Uh, BT say a lot of stuff in smart cities, so they would naturally want to, want to focus um, their attentions there. But it's also, to a certain extent, about um, just pick one or pick two. Just, just focus some attention on a, on, on a particular area because then you get replicability of, of, of what you're doing and you get learning and you start moving into that services space that um, you don't necessarily have to be a systems integrator to be able to, 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 to build the, the, the tremendous expertise in. No, that's, that's very interesting. So you said like what, what Stefan was saying, he's saying that that is basically the approach that others, others should take and just be generally much more focused. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Tonga. Yeah, if I could sort of chip in on the whole on the value chain, I, I think essentially there are sort of three broad approaches that operators can take, and they're not mutually exclu exclusive. But the, the first is just to provide connectivity, um, which is what most operators are doing, kind of the default business. But as I mentioned before, the revenues are not massive; it's not going to shift the needle for the for the overall business. Then the the other extreme is to provide end-to-end -end solutions. It's it's a brand, it's operator branded. They're providing everything: the hardware, the application, the service, and so on. And we've seen operators do that a number of areas, most obviously in fleet management. Um, so Verizon company has done this most. It's it bought a bunch of fleet management companies. It spent more than $3 billion doing so. Um, but now part of Verizon is now a fleet management company. And that looks very different from the rest of, of Verizon. There are some similarities. There's hardware, there's a service. So it's got, it looks similar-ish as a business. But still, it's, it's a very different market. It's got different sales channels. It's got different challenges. Now, if operators want to do that across lots of different verticals, then they kind of have to become a conglomerate. And most operators don't want to become a conglomerate. So then there's the, so that might be replicable in, in a few markets. Consumer IoT, I think, is an interesting one to play in. Um, so it might be replicable in, in a few, but probably not too many. Um, and then the third approach is, is that kind of intermediate, is to provide some elements, some of the capabilities that a, an operator has, some of the things that Matt was talking about, some of the things that Stefano was talking about before. So that. Um, hardware is, is one, not particularly high margin, but it's a, a good fit with the existing business. Um, device management, some of the other platform services, security, an obvious one. So putting together things um, where they can be more easily productized and where they might be more applicable across various different vertical markets, rather than doing something too specific in a, a particular type of farming or whatever it is. Um, and that, I think, probably fits better with the traditional telco model of, of, of selling products. Um, I think, the, in, a, in a sense, if we are going to get to these billions of devices, there can't be millions of consulting projects. It's not going to, it's not going to scale. That's going to be too expensive. Um, they've got, it's got to be products. So I'm not sure about systems integrated. I'm not sure it really fits with... I mean, operators have, various operators have had various attempts of being system integrators. Some have worked and some haven't. It's not the natural, it's not the obvious fit for, for operators. But where operators do really well is, is, is productizing stuff. And, and that, maybe, that fits, I think, better with, with, with the rest of the business. Can, can, I, can I disagree a little bit on that? I mean, you, you look at, um, okay, so Deutsche Telekom. Yeah. The, the IoT business has, has kind of shifted from T-Mobile focus to a T-Systems focus in the recognition that where they can really deliver value and add, add value is, is as a IT service provider, systems integrated, whatever you might want to term it. So that's kind of driving their business now. They see it as higher value add rather than just providing connectivity. So there's a, you know. Yes, yeah, so, so definitely, definitely they're doing that, but. How, how the, the margins on that, not too sure. How scalable is it? And wh where do telcos want to be in 2020, 2025? But do the, they want to turn into these systems integrators or do they want to be turning out products? But the, but the question of scalability is, is, is something of a moot one, right? There, there, are, there are a lot of, of companies out there that want to be IoT unicorns, right? So they want to be the scale platform that, that can connect a billion things or, or, or have some kind of finger in a, a, a billion pies. Um, but... Um, that's not telcos, right? Telcos aren't trying to get the unicorn valuation. So something which is heavy lifting and not um, uh, universally scalable, like a company like Microsoft would be looking for, or like a company or, or startups like, like ThingWorks as was would be, would be looking for, to attract that valuation without really necessarily making any revenue is, is, is absolutely fine. But if you're a telco, what you're looking for is sustainable and ongoing revenue streams. So in, in that respect, the services business, which is lower margin and not as scalable is still quite an appealing, no, appealing space to work in. Absolutely, and that's what I'm saying. You're talking about sustainable ongoing revenues. That's precisely what systems integration isn't. Uh, the, 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 it's project-based, it's people-based, which are things that don't fit necessarily that well with many telcos. 
Yeah. But, but isn't that, I mean, <laughs> can I just, a small comment on that? I think over, overall in the operator community today, I think there is this awareness of that if we are just connectivity providers, we are part of a very profitable but probably flat or even shrinking revenue stream. And all operator managements I talk with and work with, they are, they like to see themselves as digital players. You know, we are, that's the way to be part of something bigger than just connectivity. So when we say that, when I mention system integration as, as one element, I'm not saying that operators necessarily automatically will be good at that. And it's really a, a fundamentally different business from anything else they're doing. But if you are aspiring that IoT should you know, represent like 5 or 10 or 15% of your revenues, you have to engage in those activities where the money is. And I, I mean, I, I mean I, I'm a consultant myself. I also have a tremendous respect for how complicated system integration is. I mean, well-managed system integration firms, they, they have a 10% margin. And that is telling us that that can never finance build out of 5G infrastructure. You know, because when you add two pounds on your on your data plan for a consumer, that's almost bottom line, you know, contribution that will help you to finance infrastructure. Yeah. This is not that kind of business. Okay. Um, well, let's move on a little bit from, from from the value chain to a certain extent and, and talk about competition. Um, interesting to hear your thoughts. I mean, we've, there's been certainly in, in Stefano's piece. Um, uh, a little bit about some of the other players coming into into the market. Um, how much of a of a threat do you see some of these new, not so new, uh, new quote unquote uh, companies coming in are a threat to sort of telcos, IoT, um, you know, uh, their, their plans and their hopes to, to succeed in this space? You mean in connectivity? Yeah. Um, well, one of the eye-catching things from Mobile World Congress was was once, so their ten euros for ten years um, connectivity which is, I think, aimed at narrowband IoT when it becomes available, but it's including 2G and 3G. Um, that, was and a, that was Deutsche Telekom. Uh, it, well, 25% owned by Deutsche Telekom. Um, so that kind of sets a ben benchmark for the, that kind of, you know, the pricing for that sort of sensing as a service, low-level sensing, which is, which is quite, a, quite an aggressive position to, 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 um, to adopt. Um, so obviously the telcos need to need to adapt to that and and um, and, and find pricing uh, models that are more appropriate for for the higher bandwidth uh, applications and, and and so on. But I mean that's not necessarily anything new. We've had MVNOs for a, for a very long time, but they probably haven't quite been as a, uh, as aggressive in terms of, of price. But it all sort of points to the fact that um, you, you just need to have more value add, more. Um, Capabilities in there that, that that aren't just about cheap connectivity. If you wanna if you wanna compete aggressively, or you wanna you know <coughs> m maintain a a position in the market. Yeah, I mean I think if all uh, so looking at the once offer, it's very interesting and it's obviously pushed the price point down, but it's pushed it to a point that it has been talked about. This this kind of one euro a year connectivity price has been talked about for a number of years by operators as well as as non-operators, um, and if the only differentiator of once is price, then I think they're in trouble because price is very easy for other operators to match. Um, and if Deutsche Telekom's got a 25% stake in them, then they're saying exactly how well they're doing. And if they're doing really well, then they can match that price. When you think of the MVNOs from the, from the consumer space, they had some sort of other differentiator. They had a different cost base. They have different sales channels. Now, if we're talking about um, low power connectivity, if you, that's going to be zero touch sale, you'd have thought. It has to be for that sort of cost. Um, and again, that's something that the operator, that's something a Vodafone or a Deutsche Telekom or an Orange could, could replicate very easily. Um, so then yeah, it goes to Matt's point, what, are the other differ what else is being offered? What are the other differentiators? Uh, and that, I think, is harder for a Once or a, a Sigfox to, to compete against a, um, either a player using LoRa, some very interesting propositions there, or, or the, the narrowband IoT ecosystem and, and, and mobile operators. But then you, 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 pick a, you pick a vertical or two, right? So the, the, the challenge for... Um for selling connectivity is, is, is mostly around how, how do you persuade companies in the agriculture sector or companies in, in various industrial sectors that, 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 that you're the 
company. You're the connectivity provider of, uh, of choice in that, in that sector. And that requires you know, good old-fashioned marketing, going out to their trade shows, uh, getting in their trade mags, doing, doing all this kind of stuff. Um, and that, that might be a specialist thing for specialist MVNOs that aren't really actually differentiated for that vertical, but they, you know, they pick one or two and say, we're the guys who provide connectivity for agriculture, and, and that actually there's, there's quite a niche there. What, what I think is challenging is being a provider of undifferentiated connectivity, um, so like the, the traditional MVNO type, type model. Um, but I think if you've, if you've got a, a, a route to market or a, a, an aggressive marketing strategy focusing on a, a, a particular vertical, then I think it's, um, th there is actually an opportunity there. Yeah. If that's their differentiator. If their differentiator is they understand vertical uh, agriculture and they go deeply into it, yeah. Can I, uh, just to comment on that, I think, first of all, MVNOs overall um, is not sort of a spectacular success sort of over a 20-year period. Uh, and it's because... We have never had a fully working wholesale model in this industry. Everything from an MNO perspective is bought at the retail minus price, where the seller of the services is, is making sure that they don't face too competition from the MVNO partner. So I think it will have to be a very specialized niche of the market for an IoT MNO to be successful, where they are adding value to the host operator rather than anything else. I think the, the, the biggest competitor we have, or competing, uh, I mean, most of the players coming into the IoT space, uh, or the ones we've been talking about, the big consulting firms and software solution firms, they probably add value to operators because they are important partners. The, the competition part comes into, I think, how of it, Will, uh, how much it will be 3GPP-based technologies and how much will come from elsewhere. And I, I'll take a very quick example. We, uh, in the municipality where I live, we change water meters. They, they change out all water meters in 10,000 households, which I thought was interesting because I'm interested in IoT. So when I try to look at the spec of that product, it turns out that there is something called M-Bus, m Bus, as it, I never heard of that protocol before. I asked my colleagues, they never heard of it either. You probably have, but I haven't. And it turns out it's a very, very small, narrow protocol, very suitable for short-range communication. And what happens, happens is that when the garbage truck passes by the house every week, that water meter wakes up and sends the water meter, a water consumption to the garbage truck. And it's then downloaded to the, when they come to the to municipality uh, center. So, you know, that, that sort of IoT deal was never seen by any operator. And when, they, when that water meter company selected that technology, they, they probably looked at buying something with a SIM card and talking to operators, but they thought it was a much cheaper solution to provide that service. And that's just one example. You know, there are many, many different mm -hmm. connectivity methods that, that, that we will see growing mm -hmm. here. And I know we've got um, some water, water metering stuff coming up later on, on today, so we'll, we'll, hear, we'll hear about that. Um, just, just, just one final thought on the, the wholesale thing. Can I, can I come back to that? Okay. Um, or, or the MVNO space, actually. Um, so we, we're seeing the expectation of some quite aggressive rollouts of, of narrowband IoT. I, I use the term rollout advisedly because it's mostly software switching and whatever. But, but effectively, availability of, of MB IoT networks, Vodafone 90% coverage in the UK by the end of the year. These are going to be empty networks initially, right? And ha how did historically people fill up empty networks? It was with MVNOs. Okay, um, and so I, I suspect for the next three to five years, there's a there's a decent opportunity with MVNOs in uh, specifically in, in in narrowband IoT to go hunt down the the, the, the potential customers, um, be be more um, sort of um, hand to hand fighting for for the um, for for the, the the first bunch of of IoT uh, MB IoT uh, clients. Excellent. We'll, we'll, we'll track that and see how that see how that progresses. Um, Mobile Europe conducts an annual survey of, it, of its readers, and um, the latest one from December um, asked a few questions about the IoT, um, and um, particularly on, on, on the biggest sort of challenge to their overall success and, uh, and strategy. Um, and um, poor business models was found to be the biggest threat um, to them. Um, they, that came ahead of a lack of an overall strategy and then um, security. So I'm kind of interested to get your three thoughts on the, uh, so the question was, um, the biggest threat to um, Telco's IoT strategy and success. Um, 
poor business models was kind of number one securities in there. Interesting to get your thoughts on, 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 on whether you agree uh, or, or not, what other ones might be, uh, might be a threat. Um, can I say I think you read the wrong... Um, <laughs> I think the that means you lot, by the way. <laughs> well, the, so the, the, the big problem that I, I think, we live in this bubble and we all know what IoT is and we're all talking about it and we understand the issues and we're thinking about security and all these other issues with it. Um, we've done it, another survey of enterprises, so all enterprises not necessarily interested in IoT, and we asked them how advanced they are, were with their IoT plans. Now, the really interesting result out of that is that half of the responses, they either didn't know what IoT was or they knew what it was and they weren't interested. Now, we think of IoT as affecting basically every business or every vertical, pretty much. Um, but that's clearly not happening. If you're talking to enterprises, that they, as I say, they don't know what it is or they know what it is and they're not interested. So that suggests to me that, that bigger than, than business models and this other stuff, the real big problem we've got is awareness. Um, and it may be that talking about IoT doesn't help because it doesn't really mean anything. Mostly, we're going to be talking about smart agricultural solutions or a smarter retail solution or, or, or digitalization more, more generally. Um, awareness seems to me a much bigger, a bigger challenge than, than some of these other issues. Well, it's, it's that identity problem that I was talking about. Yeah. Matt, do you want to... Yeah, yeah as, I, as, I'm, as, I'm already, uh, as I'm already talking. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's hard to disagree with that. And, and I throw in... Um, kind of internal business transformation process that, that, um, that telcos have to, have to undergo. Um, and in fact, Stefano was talking about this in, in, in some detail in terms of, okay, well, we're, we're not selling connectivity anymore, we're selling something else. But do the internal processes, the, the skills of the sales team, the, um, the feedback mechanisms for, for taking learnings from one project and feeding it back into the team to make sure they, they know how to talk to factories or know how to talk to companies that make... Um, tractors or what, what, whatever um, whether those systems are in place so actually there's an, kind of an internal education internal skills assessment kind of a, kind of a thing that needs to, to happen with, um, with, 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 with telcos and, and just on the identity thing, and just to really nail that down so what, what you're saying is that they need to pick, pick a vertical they want, they want to target and really kind of market a solution on that, around that particular vertical well not necessarily market a solution but just, just say we are not well to, to a certain extent, they're going to be providing to, to everybody because there is a, a baseline uh, role as a provider of connectivity that, that they will inevitably play. But a lot of that will be reactive rather than necessarily proactive. Or where it is proactive, it's more existing sales channels and, and, and so on. But where they'll be more proactive, or where they'll, they'll gain economies of scale is being proactive in picking some, some, um, some verticals where they can learn what it is that agriculture companies or car manufacturers or, 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 or whatever, whatever might, um, might want. And that's where you have more of a dedicated sales team. But probably what I'm talking about, actually, is, is the established sales team. Yeah, well... You know, there's a bit of specialisation of that of that of that team. There's a bit of reskilling of the existing um, uh, enterprise sales channel. You know, that kind of thing. Okay. Right. Well, we we've talked and had some debate for for quite a while now. Um, who has anyone got any questions they would like to ask? Um, challenge what's been heard. Agree? Disagree? Well, I don't know. I don't know whether that's good or not. That's oh, not coming. Hey, good morning. I'm uh, Vincent Hebling from Proximus. Uh, we touched it briefly just before the panel, but I uh, was wondering, with regards to the consumer market, how do you see the role of the telco operator there? Because we talk a lot about the B2B, the consumer is another stuff. Yeah, I, I can talk to that a little bit. I, I think it's very interesting, the, the Vodafone approach. Um, not only that they're, they're, they're doing it, but also the level of... Um, um, support it's getting clearly within Vodafone. So if you listen to the, uh, the quarterly announcement, I think it was the end of last year, um, the Vodafone Group CEO had a slide on the, on the consumer IoT proposition, um, which is interesting just that it's being talked on those quarterly calls. You listen to AT&T calls, they don't, at and their IoT business is a billion dollar plus, but they hardly mention it. it. They don't mention it on their calls, they hardly mention it in their releases. Um, so it's interesting that, that not just IoT, but consumer IoT is there in, in the quarterly announcement. But also what was said on that call is that it, they're not interested in what happens this year. They don't have huge expectations for it this year or next year. It's what it happens to it in, in 10 years' time. So this kind of experimenting around the role for, for, for an operator, I, th I think, is, is, is very interesting. But clearly it's, it's not going to happen 
right, in the next three months or next six months. It's a it's a longer term play, and it needs so it needs that senior level support, which it has in, in Vodafone, maybe not so much in other operators. Yeah, I, I think it's um, really interesting, I, I, and I like consumer IoT concept because it's much more closer to the traditional business of an operator. So you can use your existing retail competence and say channels and everything like that. And uh, and I, I, I agree with Tom here that I, I am, and also what Vodafone itself is saying that we shouldn't expect to see maybe staggering numbers in 2019 or so, but the the long-term potential when NBIoT is a very mature product and with you know the next generation chipsets are coming and so forth and everything you can put NBIoT into, that has really some interesting potential. And again, it's quite similar in many fashions to what your operators are doing today. So it has some potential, definitely. Uh, I disagree. Yay, we have some, we have some, uh, some disagreement on the, on, the, on the panel. So I think it's mostly a wholesale play, to be perfectly honest. I mean, you look at the, the, the two main categories of uh, of consumer products, that's standalone consumer electronics, like cameras and games consoles and music. No, not music players, because that's a, that's an iPhone. But you know, a bu bu bunch of those those kind of uh, of C devices, and it's smart home. And up until now, uh, taking the last one first, smart home. Well, we're seeing smart home. I think about what I've got. I've got at home. I've got a Sonos system. I've got a smart thing system. I've got you know a whole whole bunch of connected devices sitting in my home. None of it's anything to do with my 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 telco. So it, it what's dominated up until now is that over the top play, and it all interacts with and integrates pretty well with each other. I can't get Siri to activate my Sonos, but you know that, I'm sure that'll come 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 pretty soon. But you know all, all of that stuff has has come, and what we haven't seen really, or what's flattered to deceive, is, is, is telco smart home offering. Even uh, AT&T D Digital Life hasn't exactly been, been tearing up any trees. So um, that, that, I think, is pretty limited. When you think of the consumer electronics side, side of things, that's not how people buy a camera. Take the camera example. You walk into your telco store to buy a camera? No, of course not. You, you, you go on Amazon, you go into a specialist electronics retailer. Uh, there might be one or two um, use cases where there's a there's a, there's an operator um, channel that, that that makes some sense, but for the most part, that's not how people buy a connected version. You go you go to the shop that sells the connected and the unconnected versions next to each other, but the telco is not going to do that. So um, I, I tend to think that the consumer electronics space is a, is about selling some sims and some connectivity. Now, V by Vodafone might be a good way to kind of encourage the market, show them what's possible, that kind of stuff. That's and that and that and that's fine, but. Um, I, I don't think that's where, where um, a huge amount of revenue lies. Okay. Any more questions? Enrico. Enrico Bagnasco, Telecom Italia. Do, do you see any regional differences? Europe, US, Far East. You, do you see any different drivers, uh, speed? Uh, speed in market? It's a good question. Um, flum flummox. No, if you've got an answer, Tom, go, go, go for it. There's, there's clearly a difference in um, what we're seeing in richer com countries, high-income countries. You're seeing a lot more activity than you do in, in lower-income countries. E even as so we track the rollout of narrowband IoT, or, yeah, the, the, the rollout of narrowband IoT networks, and they are uh, not exclusively, but almost exclusively in in, in high-income countries. Um, China's the exception kind of as always, and, and the, the massive exception. So there's certainly, there's certainly that difference. Um, th there are some differences in, uh, in some of the products that are being, being experimented with. I mean, if you look at the, um, the approach of the big operators with large domestic markets, they're being much, they're being much more ambitious and aggressive. So if you think of the, the US operators, um, the Korean operators, the Chinese operators, they're being more aggressive in what they're trying to take on and what they're trying to do, um, probably even more so than, 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 than a Vodafone. Um, so there are some, some differences there um, as to how much they rely on, on partners and how much they try and build in, in, internally. So there are some some differences. I'm not sure a huge amount. Well, I mean, there's, there's regulatory uh, environments as well, which w which will vary. You know, the extent to which you're deploying smart meters, and, and you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff like that, which is which is specific to the 
uh, to the geography and there's you know disposable income and there's you know uh, there's a bunch of things like that but um, in terms of fundamental differences and certainly fundamental differences in terms of the way that telcos address the market no not a not a, not a huge amount I wouldn't have said I mean there are, there are oh, sorry go I was going to say, uh, it, on the smart home thing, there is uh, interesting differences. I think in, so in the US, like Matt said, AT&T Digital Life not being a, a massive success, but Comcast and what it's trying to do with its Xfinity home is, is quite interesting and it has been quite successful. Um, it's had, I think it, it claims more than a million subscribers. How many of those are paying? What exactly that means? I, I, I don't know. Um, but that's built on a, the, the, the market for home security in the US is, is much bigger than it is elsewhere. Something like fifth, I don't. Know, it's probably got better figures, but I, I've heard something like fifteen percent of households, more than that, twenty-six. Okay, twenty-six percent of households in the U.S. pay for some sort of home or have some sort of home security in the U.S. So it's a much bigger market than in in, in Europe, where it's I don't know less than five percent. I think in most countries. So there seems to be more of an opportunity there. Um, so certainly Comcast is doing quite well. Um, and, and then you look at things like manufacturing. You know, where so it's 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 no. Uh, surprise that Industry 4.0 is, is, is much more German focused than it is anywhere else, certainly in Europe, because, you know, we don't make stuff here, right? So the, the, the industrial stuff doesn't really matter that much in the, in, in the UK. I'm generalizing apologies to any UK industrial companies. Um, but that, you know, that's, there, there, is a, there is a truth there that, that these kind of things will emerge as, uh, as necessary. Okay. Right, last chance for a question before we sum up. No? Okay. So, um, yeah, so we said this panel was, was does the IoT have a credibility problem? Um, and as I think uh, Tom uh, alluded to at the beginning, this was from uh, particularly an actual, was an actual quote from, from one uh, analyst firm who were not present, I should add, um, who said that the predictions for the market um, were, were way overhyped and it was far from being uh, mainstream. Um, but if we look, kind of look um, ahead, 2018-2019, um, um, just to sort of sum up, guys, would you say that you are more or less optimistic about telcos and their ability to succeed in the IoT space than, than you were maybe the last time we did this event? Thank do you want to start on that one? Um, hard to say. I mean, I, I think IoT overall, or digitalization, which I rather prefer calling it, has enormous potential and is happening around the world in every industry vertical, very big projects. I, I think, you know, why put my view is that uh, it's more a choice of, for operators how big they like to be in IoT. And if they like to be big in IoT, they probably need to develop skills that are outside the core competence they have today. And that's, you know, uh, that also means something for the, for my, from the investor community. If I, if I was an analyst, uh, and we're seeing that uh, my favorite operator were getting 15% revenues from IoT, then I would rather look at that side of the business as I do with any other software solutions firm, rather than look at it as a, an operator business. Okay, Tom? So, I don't think I expect, I, personally, compared to a year ago, I don't think all, all that different. Um, and we can, I think maybe we could sound a bit too negative. Well, if you look at it, if you look at Vodafone's IoT business, what it was 720 million euros last year. It's a big, it's a big company, and what the MTN team's been around for 10, 10 years. So not many companies have grown from zero to 700 million in, in, in a decade. Um, certainly not within a telco. Um, you look at AT&T, you look at Verizon. They're, they're both going to earn more than a billion dollars from from IoT this year. Um, on average, growing what 15% year on year. So. It, it, it's, it's small relative to the telco business, but standalone, these are, these are big businesses and they're growing very quickly. 15% year on year is, is rapid growth. So reasons to be optimistic. Reasons to be optimistic, but also it, it's not going to take over the, the telco business. It's not going to be twice the size of the mobile business. It's going to be a, 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 a nice additional chunk of extra revenue. Matt? Um, I, I'd say more optimistic, if I'm, if I'm honest. Um, it, it, coming back to the point I made about um, some of the big box vendors deciding that actually they're going to get with the program and be supportive both in terms of um, not competing, not, not trying to get into that, 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 um, the connectivity space, providing some, some ready-to-use applications that the telcos can take out of market, that, that, that kind of thing. So that's, so that's a positive. Um, I also think that the, uh, we're getting some, some positive messages from the, from the telecom space about um, 
addressing some of the, 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 the challenges that they might have had, just in terms of the internal structural things. We've got new networks coming. I think, you know, on, on balance, I'm, I think it's, uh, I think compared to, to where we would have been 18 months ago, I'm more optimistic. Well, but I'm an optimistic kind of guy, so, you know. <laughs> well, that's a good place to finish. Um, I'd like to thank um, Ben, Tom, and Matt for that very interesting panel. Thank you very much. Um, we have a...